Hey this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science a podcast for data science enthusiasts where i interview practitioners researchers and calculators about their journey experience and talk all things about data science Hello and welcome to another episode of the Chai Time Data Science Show. In this episode, I interview Eugene Kwechenya, a Kaggle competition master ranked in the top 150 on the platform and a computer vision consultant. We talk all about his journey into the field and Kaggle and his recent team gold finish on the Severstal Steel Defect Detection Kaggle competition where uh, his team finished fourth bringing another gold medal uh, to his profile. Eugene uh, also shares many great pieces of advice around writing code good code and especially good code for kaggle competitions along with a uh, discussion on his open source efforts on albumentations and another framework that he's currently working on called pytorch toolbelt all of to which you can find a description in the links uh, section of this podcast also if you would like to know more about albumentations uh, there's another interview with dr vladimir iglovo kiv on this uh, podcast so do check that out in case you're interested for now here's my interview with eugene all about kaggle his recent solution and best coding practices please enjoy the show along with a quick note and an apology to the listeners as you might have noticed i have not been releasing any interviews for the past two or three weeks and that is because i've decided to invest a lot of efforts into converting all of the previous 27 interviews on this series into blog posts along with working on putting a proper data science term checked subtitles for them i'd also make an announcement starting now slowly the blog posts of the previous 27 interviews will be rolling out in parallel you can find the link to the website where these will be released along with all of the future video releases will have checked subtitles to help improve your experience instead of working towards the releases i spent some time putting up support material for the previous one and ensuring the future releases happen fluidly both in terms of the video and audio stream along with blog posts i hope that improves your experience a bit i am of course very open to any suggestions this is a suggestion that i always wanted to work on so in case you have any other ideas that you would want me to incorporate please do send them my way and i hope this improves your experience of tuning into chai time data science a little bit without further ado here's the conversation Hello Eugene thank you so much for joining me on the Chai Time Data Science podcast and especially agreeing for the AMA section Thanks uh, for the invitation it's a pleasure to be here I am honored to have you on the show uh talking about your background you have a masters in software engineering and you have been working on computer vision for a decade now could you tell us how did you get started with uh, data science or machine learning broadly speaking uh sure so um my background uh, comes from the classical computer vision and uh, uh this uh, decade i was uh, doing uh, computer vision on uh, c++ or uh python and uh, in the start of uh, 2018 mm-hmm. i uh, started investing more into the deep learning and machine learning since i realized uh, this is a really hot topic mm-hmm. and uh, what uh, convinced me to to this switch was understanding of the fact that uh, the amount of efforts is needed to build uh, some image classification or object detection system 
uh, using deep learning techniques is uh, way smaller than it would okay. be required to do the same for the classical handcrafted computer vision. Mm -hmm. Uh, talking more about the classical area, so you actually have a hall of fame, as you mentioned it on your Kaggle profile, and you're currently a, co a consultant in the computer vision area. Could you tell us more about your off Kaggle life and the problems that you're working on? Uh, sure. So, um, yeah, as you've seen on my Kaggle profile, I was into many topics, and currently I'm uh, working at uh, Jumio. It's a company who's doing much uh, identity verification as a service. Mm -hmm. And uh, there we have plenty of uh, tasks, um, but without going into the, the very deep details, which I think I don't able to share, uh, mm -hmm. we're using images to extract all the information from them using okay. the passport photos or driver license photos. So it's... Uh, Many topics, uh, all related to computer vision, OCR, face mm -hmm. uh, detection. Got it. And you're working on the deep learning stack or uh, even the classical algorithms? Um, it's a combination of both. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So there's still a lot of room for the classical computer vision, I think, in many topics, in many areas, not only in our company, but overall. So um, it's good to have knowledge in a in the both domains. Mm -hmm. uh, during my research, I also found three very interesting themes on your Instagram profile. I'll have it linked for the listeners if they want to check it out, which is sports, uh, travel, and graphic cards, lots, lots and lots of them. <laughs> Could you <laughs> tell us more about your life outside of uh, the technical world and what sports do you compete in and how do you balance this lifestyle? Uh, sure, and thanks for the question. Um, for uh, to balance uh, the work, uh, which is uh, most of the time is sitting in the chair, you have to uh, compensate this uh, with a <laughs> decent amount of physical activity. Yeah. So um, there, I uh, enjoy cycling a lot, and um, recently I uh, started doing open sea swimming, okay. uh, which I also enjoy. Mm -hmm. And in winter, all kinds of the winter activities like snowboarding, that's I'm fun of. Got so uh, to, yeah, to have this uh, work-life uh, balance or work-sport balance, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I try to do this through, through the year so that I, I keep myself in a good shape. Since uh, sitting uh, for eight or so hours before yeah. the laptop is not... Is something that your body wouldn't take, say thank you. Yeah. For the audience, I'd also like to mention that Eugene doesn't only win medals on Kaggle, he's also won a bunch of medals on uh, cycling competitions, I think. Uh, yeah, there was uh, some of them in my past and also in uh, in line skating. <laughs> uh, that, uh, yeah. Got it. So you're an active sports competitor as well outside of Kaggle. <laughs> yeah, we can we we can say that too. Yeah. Okay. Coming to Kaggle, could you tell us what made you sign up for your first competition and how did you end up getting started on Kaggle? <laughs> it's actually it was the same time I decided to uh, learn uh, deep learning, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm kind of practical kind of person who learns by solving some real challenges. Mm -hmm. I'm not very um, good at uh, just learning the pure theory. Right. I need to get my, my, my hands dirty mm -hmm. uh, with uh, some tasks. So that's why I uh, went on Kaggle. And uh, at that time, there was an uh, iceberg satellite detection challenge. It right. was uh, the start of 2018, I think. Mm -hmm. So that was my first Kaggle competition. I was totally newbie. Uh, in the deep learning and uh, I tried to make my way to this by uh, reading uh, the learning materials uh, available in a great amount on uh, YouTube, uh, mm -hmm. streaming some lectures and uh, basically building uh, my set of knowledge and my set of skills mm -hmm. and uh, at that competition I finished it about on the 100 something place. Right. 
Um, and it was the first time and the first lesson to me that I learned is the <laughs> on the Kaggle, look for data leaks first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah, in, the, in that competition, there was a huge data leak that uh, alone itself uh, was able to get about, I mean, top 50 maybe. <laughs> Um, but usually, ideally, that shouldn't be the case with most of the competition. It's true. It's true. But if you're com- doing a competitive uh, machine learning, it's something they should always keep in mind. And th- that was the lesson I learned from there. And uh, and then I continued to uh, participate in uh, all uh, image-related uh, competitions. Great. And uh, yeah, the first gold medal we won as a team was a Data Science Bowl 2018. We'll just, uh, we'll just talk more about your recent uh, gold finish, but uh, could you give us another a deeper idea of how do you approach learning materials, for example, uh, online courses, any of your favorites, or when you mention you're experimenting along with learning, uh, any tips or your path of how do you approach it? Um, so usually I uh, do the following. Uh, when there is an... Um, let's say, new material or new video posted by, let's say, uh, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I watch it uh, either um, just uh, uh, fully or Mm -hmm. by chance and then try to immediately uh, follow the idea and implement it, Mm -hmm. if if it's an implementation idea, right? So um, as I said, I'm a practical person and... uh, without implementing it's uh, for me it's useless so i i really <laughs> like to impl- implement stuff uh yeah. write code and uh, by doing this i i learn it better i would say so Got it. not not only learn as vanilla implementation how it's written in some paper but uh, do your own uh, small changes to see what's really the key of the article you're implementing? So what's the crucial effect mm-hmm. it had? That, that's, I think, uh, what works best for me. Got it. For the audience, mm-hmm. I'd like to mention that do check out the course by Jeremy Howard. It's called Fast.ai if you're not familiar with it. It's it's one of the best courses in my opinion as well. Yeah, uh, I, fo- I found this course is uh, super useful uh, to know this uh, know-how, there's really great amount, great source information. Yeah, for sure. Uh, coming back to your Kaggle and now professional life, how do you balance this Kaggle professional and sports uh, lifestyle? How do you balance your day and night and Kaggle and work? Uh, so the answer is simple. I usually um, have a couple of hours before I go to sleep. Mm-hmm. Uh, that I uh, spent on writing uh, some experiment code, um, and uh, I just put it, uh, <clears throat> put my models, put my experiments to training. Great. So while I sleep or do working at the daytime, uh, the GPU fans are spinning. GPU is busy. <laughs> Yes, GPU is busy, definitely. So this is uh, something that allows me to um, do work and other activities while the model is training. So, mm-hmm. or I start the training and then I go to the gym or cycling, whatever, and uh, it doesn't require you to be present. Yeah. <laughs> the, mod- the model can, can be trained without your attention. And uh, that's, that's what helps me. Got it. And uh, do you think after you started competing on Kaggle and getting these amazing results that I'm sure many of the audience is familiar with, uh, did it impact your professional life in any way? Did you have any takeaway learnings that you applied to the real world after that? Um, for me, it's hard to overestimate uh, how helpful um, competing on Kaggle was for me. Hmm. Um, the amount of uh, experience you get by uh, going deep into a particular problem is uh, is just a tremendous. And uh, you learn new architectures, you learn new approaches, you learn new ways to train your models, you learn new frameworks. And uh, this gives all you the ground to perform better on your um, work or other pet projects. 
Got so it. From, from this context, I would say uh, it was really helpful to me to uh, get into the deep learning since mm -hmm. I was then I was able to uh, use the, the knowledge I got there in other places. Got it. Uh, so, coming to frameworks, uh, I've actually interviewed Dr. Vladimir Iglu who came about albumentations to which you're a core contributor. So he's mm -hmm. already talked about his side of the story for the audience. Do check out that interview. But I'd also love to know more about your side of how did you get started with the framework and contributing uh, to the idea? Um, so just to give your um, our audience a bit of context, the Albumentations is the image augmentation library that uh, is massively used uh, on Kaggle for the image augmentations. And um, I got into the core team um, by adding um, a new functionality there, so um, which I actually wrote for uh, some uh, past competitions. Mm -hmm. So um, the library itself was released, uh, I think, after Data Science Bowl mm -hmm. 2018. So uh, at that time, um, I, I had my own, um, let's, let's call it uh, mini augmentation library. Okay. Uh, that uh, then I quickly throw to garbage and uh, switch <laughs> to augmentations uh, since I found it uh, really align it with my line of thinking how the image augmentation could be done and uh, i started using it on a regular basis in our competitions and mm -hmm. uh, on demand i added new features there and to allow others uh, to use it so i made pull requests and at some point uh, guys uh, proposed that uh, I became uh, one of the maintainers and yep. uh, also helped them on uh, in improving the library on some sort of the regular basis. Got it. So this is this is how I got into the maintainers. Your Kaggle uh, work also led you to becoming a better open source contributor in a way. Uh, indeed, it is. Um, before this, I haven't considered uh, to to do this uh, sort of the open source contribution, but um, I love it now. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's, it's good to realize that uh, library is used and appreciated by community. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's a great feeling. For sure. Uh, could you tell us more about another framework that I think you recently started? It's called PyTorch uh, Tool Builds. Uh, yeah, uh, it's um, currently just a product of mine. Mm -hmm. And um, at some point I realized that um, the code I write uh, for the Kaggle competitions, it uh, doesn't change a lot. Mm -hmm. And there are typical uh, building blocks that I tend to reuse over and over again with the small modifications maybe, but uh, the idea remains the same. Mm -hmm. So it took me maybe three or four uh, challenges to realize I'm just waste, wasting my time on uh, copy pasting and mm -hmm. uh, recalling where I change something or where I introduce that feature or fix that bug. So uh, essentially I filtered all these uh, blocks and uh, built uh, library uh, mm -hmm. for just keeping them in one place and uh, 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 so that I can reuse them easily. Got it. And also, so this is was, was the initial idea and it was tailored for the PyTorch library, which is my uh, library of choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it uh, became more and more mature and uh, the new features like uh, test time augmentations that can be done on the GPU mm -hmm. or a flexible uh, way of building your models and switching uh, the encoder without uh, having to rewrite your whole model. So all these um, building blocks helps me to uh, quickly iterate over ideas that I have in the, in the, in the competitions. 
And that was the purpose of this library, to be a tool belt. So it gives you tools to perform. <laughs> I think uh, this is again a quote from a previous interview that I've done. A smart person uh, back in the day used to have a large library of books. Now smart people like you just have open source libraries that they keep contributing to. Uh, I I think it's uh, is uh, it's a really effective way to first of all um, become visible uh, to the community and also uh, to kind of offer what you have. And instead, you give some feedback of uh, community needs. Mm -hmm. And this also helps you to understand what actually is required, or maybe you are missing some part of the puzzle. Got it. From this perspective, I think it's a win-win to everyone. And as I said, uh, it's also um, good to understand that uh, this uh, small piece of the open source uh, code that you wrote is actually used by others. Yep. Uh, do you have any best advice for uh, some newbie who's looking to get started with open source contributions? Um, I think it's actually very good to uh, try to get into the uh, Google Summer of Code or similar events uh, by other companies. Mm -hmm. And uh, even for the uh, implementations, we have plenty of uh, easy issues for the newcomers mm -hmm. where one can uh, start with something, something really relatively simple yet uh, with its value. So uh, looking for the projects uh, that has this uh, uh, filler issues, I think it's the easiest way to get into the open source. Got it. Uh, we'll have argumentations linked in the description of this podcast. Do check that out in case you're interested. Um, now, before we talk all about your gold position and uh, the fourth team position finish, uh, first of all, congratulations to you on the amazing finish. And also, you just broke into the top 150 uh, rankings of Kaggle competitions. Uh, yes, uh, that's, uh, that's a good achievement, I think. And uh, I'm not going to stop here. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe by the time the audience gets to hear this, you might have a better rank than this. Uh, uh, the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> coming to the competition, it's, it's a tongue twister, but it's called Severstal Steel Defect Detection Kaggle uh, Competition. Could it help me set the stage by telling us what the challenge uh, was in this competition? Uh, the challenge was uh, in a detection um, the steel defects that appear when the steel gets forged. Um, and the problem statement was that where I was asked to build a system that would do a semantic segmentation of uh, steel uh, sheets, I think, made by special kind of the camera uh, that produce grayscale images of 1,600 pixels width, but only 256 pixels height. Mm -hmm. And on this image, uh, we had to detect um, four uh, classes of the steel defects and uh, produce a mask uh, indicating where each particular defect class is. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the main challenge, I think, for this competition was the uh, extreme class imbalance uh, in the training data. Okay. It has uh, um, maybe one, just a percent uh, of one rare class uh, and uh, another class dominated heavily in the training samples. And there was roughly a half of the training data without defects at all. Got it. And the, sec and the second uh, challenge uh, for this uh, competition was it was a synchronous kernel only competition, meaning okay. that um, you have a limited amount of time, a limit to do the inference on the train set that is uh, unseen. You cannot see that real uh, test data. And <laughs> it's actually great, I think. And uh, this puts all the team in the same conditions. So yep. you cannot build the crazy ensemble of the 50 models <laughs> and uh, have just unreasonable inference time. 
Uh, yeah. I think it's really good to, to have uh, more and more of such uh, challenges on the cargo. Mm -hmm. So these these are two main uh, challenges I think that uh, com that uh, participants was solving. Uh, could you tell us once you got interested in the competition and uh, discovered the challenges of it, what were your first go-to steps and how did you approach this problem? Um, most of the time, my approach is uh, similar. Uh, in, I write uh, some, I call it fit uh, predict script mm -hmm. that uh, <laughs> establish my baseline right. for uh, any, any kind of problem that uh, it is. And the idea here is to uh, ensure that uh, the training loop itself, the data preparation is uh, bug free. Mm -hmm. So I, I can provide a reasonable model and I can do a submission in the format that is required. So kind of make, make the baseline. This is the mm -hmm. first step. Okay. Don't, don't, uh, um, try to get uh, silver, bronze, gold from the first submission. Uh, the goal <laughs> yeah. is to ensure you have a solid uh, baseline. Mm -hmm. So that you have, so the code itself is clean. So that uh, even if you, let's say, put it for one month on ice, do something else and then go back, you still can understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. So uh, I often hear from others like, it's a it's a competition. We have no time uh, to make our code clean. Yeah, uh, I, I I respectfully disagree with this statement. The quality of the code that you write is really important uh, for the cargo as well. Mm -hmm. It's maybe even more important than the quality of code you're doing for your just everyday job. Because mm -hmm. on cargo you have very very limited amount of time. Yeah. And the cost of the mistake, if they happen to have in your code, is multiplied since it's most of it's usually uh, the difference between winning and losing. Mm -hmm. That's so, a great. And if, and if you can uh, avoid doing mistakes by using well structured code, uh, static code checking, uh, auto formatting, or ID features to help you spot and uh, uh, fix the issues, mm -hmm. why, why not use it? For sure. Um, yeah, so that, that's why my, my uh, suggestion is to have a strong baseline, have a clean baseline with a clean code that you are 100% uh, sure it's, uh, it don't have issues and uh, build your way uh, from there. I think it also leads to amazing uh, libraries eventually. Maybe if, if you keep doing it consistently for a while, you might end up with something similar to albumentations or uh, the toolkit. Uh, true, uh, true. Um, so I'm competing on the Kaggle almost two years from now, and I have uh, some sort of templates for any kind of problems could be either image segmentation or object detection or classification. And I think pretty much, pretty much everyone already have something similar to it. Yeah. And uh, to me, the key um, idea I try to follow is write as less code as possible. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you can use um, existing deep learning framework, uh, there is no reason to use it. Uh, use image augmentation library without reinventing the wheel. Yeah. Uh, or use whatever a source you find uh, confident and uh, well-maintained is worth using. This way you write less code by yourself. And by this, you reduce the chance of making a mistake. Again, because you're under the time constraint as well, so uh, you can invest your time better if you're using pre-written code. Definitely, definitely. Even if it's uh, if this code written by you and for some past competitions, it's a good idea just to keep to copy paste it and uh, adjust it uh, yeah. without from writing from scratch. Uh, this again put us into requirement that to, to have clean <laughs> code. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you find any of your previous uh, code being useful in this uh, steel detection competition? Uh, yes, true. And um, actually, I. 
I refactored it and to make uh, recent uh, PyTorch tool belt released exactly for this competition. Okay. So that loss function and metrics are supported, supporting the steel challenge. <clears throat> Interesting. And I, I constantly reuse uh, the pieces of the code uh, from my past competitions in the ongoing. I think it's, uh, this is how it should be. Since mm -hmm. most of the time, uh, the problem can be narrowed to three big classes. Is it is a classification problem or it is a segmentation or the object detection. Yeah. So essentially you just need three solid pipelines <laughs> that you then can extend to the particular problem. For it, sure. it, it sounds uh, quite easy, right? Um, but um, without going into very deep details, it's, it is. <laughs> Also, definitely, as in takeaway for me and the audience, please do spend some time writing clean code. Uh, can you tell us more about your team for this particular competition? How do you, in general, maybe pick your teammates and distribute the workflow? How do you track your experiments or come up with ideas uh, when working with uh, Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so in this competition, um, we... Uh, have a team of three of us, um, Boris Timchenko, Dmitris Podorets, and I. Uh, we are from the same city, and uh, guys has been uh, working on this steel competition uh, at the beginning, and I joined it uh, not uh, maybe before the months, mm -hmm. uh, before the end, uh, since I was busy in the Aptos blindness detection. Challenge. Wait, I think uh, you gold medal in that competition. Yeah, and um, solo gold medal. <laughs> <laughs> True, but we can we can speak about it later. Yeah. Uh, so in in steel, um, our guys uh, had uh, plenty of uh, GPU resources in the cloud, and uh, they offered uh, yeah, to join and uh, join our forces uh, on. Uh, so initially, when I joined, I didn't have much. Um, enthusiasm or kind of any goal has been set beforehand. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking that uh, it, it would be good if we secure the silver. Mm -hmm. So um, the reason I joined the competition was that I, I like uh, the image segmentation. It's probably one of my best um, topics. And uh, I wanted to, yeah, basically to see what, what's in the steel, uh, mm -hmm. what's data and to, how, how would it work? So that's why I joined it and I really quickly make uh, the baseline. And uh, when this baseline is correct, uh, really, really down on the leader leaderboard, maybe something like 1,000th place. I see. I, I uh, get interested, like uh, what's happening, why I'm not uh, able to get the bronze. You took up the challenge. Uh, and Yes, uh, the challenge has been accepted. <laughs> so I, I started training more and more models there. And um, at some point I get closer to the bronze. And uh, at this time I was already interested. So how, how it could be. And yeah. um, then we, tra we merged with the Boris and Dmitri <laughs> and uh, shared our ideas and the code and uh, regarding your question on how we track experiments, um, for me, what works quite well is the document on the Google or in the README, some sort of table where okay. I write, I write um, in the uh, historical order, like experiment name, what the score was on the validation, what the score was on the leaderboard, some additional comments of uh, what experiment is about. Mm -hmm. So this kind of so, sort of notebook um, helps me to keep in mind what uh, I'm actually already tried and what I have not tried yet. Okay. So, so usually at the beginning of the competition, uh, when I look at the data, I uh, make a set list of um, ideas I would like to try. Mm -hmm. Over After I have a baseline, let's say I can write something like, okay, I want to try pseudo-labeling 
or I want to try um, some interesting close functions, or there is a new paper I want to try. For me, mm -hmm. each new each new competition is an opportunity to try something new. Uh, okay. That's that's my the reason why I participate in every competition. I want to learn. I want to try new things, and uh, it's an opportunity to me. Right. Uh, there's a prevailing yeah. sentiment as well uh, that you need quite a bit of compute power uh, for gold winning solutions. Could you talk to that a bit and maybe also share your setup for this competition? Um, so in this competition. Uh, so I personally owe uh, four uh, GPUs, uh, 1080 Ti, uh, which uh, for someone it's maybe a, ter uh, a lot, yeah. right? Uh, but if we took, a, uh, let's say, a the winning solution of an open images object detection, or mm -hmm. it was a second place, but they used 120 GPUs. <laughs> <laughs> this is completely unimaginable, at least for a person like me. Right, and for me as well. And um, <laughs> a, a lot is um, not very clear thing, right? So I would say yes. that uh, for the deep learning, uh, the minimum amount of GPUs uh, to have is one. For computer vision, it, at least. It's sufficient mm -hmm. uh, to, to start. And I, I started with one GPU, and um, it's perfectly fine to to learn and to compete with others, especially mm -hmm. since you can use uh, Google Cloud credits or, or the collaboratory notebook, which gives you a decent uh, GPU or even Kaggle. Yep. Yeah, there are uh, time limits on the Kaggle kernels, but uh, it's still better than zero. For sure. So um, I can agree that having more GPUs is definitely helpful mm -hmm. than having none or one. And for me, uh, the reason of getting four GPUs is um, that, so there are two reasons actually. Okay. The first one, uh, it allows me to iterate faster mm -hmm. on uh, my ideas or my learning. I'm not speaking right now on Kaggle only, uh, I'm I'm working remotely, uh, and uh, I kind of build my own PC, which is working too. Okay. Uh, and I want my working tool to be as fast as possible and as efficient as possible. Yeah. So, if we put uh, this in this context, it uh, totally makes sense to Definitely. invest invest in your hardware. Got it. Uh now coming to experimentation, uh, as we all know, with machine learning, especially 20 to 30 experiments, uh, usually don't work, maybe more for Kaggle competitions. Uh, can you speak to that a bit? How do you uh, track your failed experiments and uh, note the takeaways from them? Yeah, um, so even 20 or 30 experiments uh, is, I would say it's reasonable. Uh, in uh, some past competitions, I recall for me, I. I ran more than 100 experiments. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, tracking them becomes uh, really cumbersome. Tensor board to um, so uh, and also making uh, notes uh, on the experiments that uh, went well and which went didn't go mm -hmm. is is a crucial. And also what I'm trying to do is um, use a Git uh, history and the branches mm -hmm. uh, to actually uh, keep each experiment more or less isolated. Okay. So let's say I have my main development uh, branch and if some experiments uh, lead to su success, it gets merged to the uh, main branch mm -hmm. uh, so that I can keep the structure of the repository clean, yeah. Uh, so when a, an experiment fails in, much, uh, for example, your modeling, how do you decide to continue giving it another try or putting an end to it? Because uh, in machine learning, the experiment doesn't work until it does. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, can give you, I can give you some examples uh, in the still challenge that I, I tried. So um, 
I had an idea that uh, if I do a very interesting trick on image augmentation, that it may help my model to generalize better. The trick was to use um, well-known mix-up augmentation, mm -hmm. but do it slightly differently. Okay. Um, uh, there is a technique on um, seamless image blending mm -hmm. um, that allows to integrate one portion of an image into another one without any noticeable uh, to naked eye um, boundary. Okay. Uh, and my idea was, okay, we have masks, so uh, for, for the ground truth annotation. So one, why not we take the random defect from one image and put it into a second image so that it, it would look natural. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrote this augmentation and it provided uh, quite good results. Uh, I mean, visually, it was really not uh, easy to say that it's artificially added effect. Yeah. And uh, then I put a training uh, uh, of the model using this augmentation. So, and I was hoping it will show rocket high uh, yeah. score on the validation and the leaderboard. And uh, it did not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it did not at all. So um, at this point, uh, I could either uh, continue debugging of this technique or try something else. Right? Yeah. And it's always uh, a decision you have to make. <laughs> so um, what I usually do is I write unit tests for my augmentations or for other things that I potentially can fail. And okay. uh, the, the unit test was showing that I did okay with the augmentation itself. And the visual inspection also didn't reveal any uh, issues. Mm -hmm. So uh, I ditched that idea okay. uh, that because we, I had really a limited amount of time uh, to work yeah. on this. So you have to be, you, know, you have to carefully choose where you spend your time. My takeaway is also that since you had written some unit tests, uh, again, from your strong software experience, uh, so after testing, if the idea doesn't work, maybe it's some time to put an end to it. Yeah, um, and uh, this, is, this is how you perform on Kaggle. You have to try as many ideas as possible, and uh, someone may work. Someone will not work, and it's OK. Yeah. Someone, you, you will have a box, and this, it's also OK. Mm -hmm. But um, you have to keep going and uh, keep trying uh, as many ideas as you can within mm -hmm. a limited amount of time. Uh, coming to the final uh, solution of your competition, could you please maybe give us a high level overview of the gold winning solution? And I'd also really love to know what led you to the 86 position jump on the private leaderboard. That's also a question by Theo VL from the AMA section. Um, yeah, so uh, our final solution uh, was an ensemble of uh, five models, um, which uh, was uh, using test time augmentation of uh, vertical and uh, horizontal flips. And uh, all their prediction has been averaged by the simple uh, mean average. And um, with a threshold of 0 0.55, we uh, end up with the binary masks. So okay. uh, it sounds quite a simple solution and uh, model architectures we have used uh, were uh, DenseNet uh, 2 uh, 1, mm -hmm. uh, ResNet 34, uh, SE ResNet 50, okay. and, and, the, and the plain ResNet 50. So um, the final inference time was about 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> so we are uh, way. Sorry, fifteen uh, minutes on uh, kernels. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the um, total inference time uh, was a fifteen minutes. So we are way below the one hour threshold. Yeah. And uh, actually, we trained way more models, uh, but combination of uh, these five uh, had a higher accuracy, a higher score on uh, validation on the leaderboard. So we end up with it. Um, apart from this, uh, we train it in uh, much heavier models, 
like uh, high, res high resolution net or um, ResNet 152 and uh, with a different kind of de decoders to produce masks. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, they didn't uh, work quite well in this competition. Okay. And uh, my, I can only speculate why we jumped so high. Uh, but uh, my understanding is that, uh, first of all, we didn't really rely on um, things like the labeling. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just show adjustment. Okay. So uh, I think combinations of two facts uh, is uh, what helped us. Since uh, the, the dice metric itself, uh, if you look at the leaderboard, uh, it's, it was really close. So, mm -hmm. um, and to make it high, uh, the difference between dice uh, 0 0.91 and 0 0.92 is um, it's nothing. <laughs> So it's essentially counting number of pixels uh, between the different predictions what put you higher. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think the fact that we didn't use uh, pseudo labeling uh, uh, worked for, for us. And uh, many, many of the teams uh, was really adjusting the show to get higher on the leaderboard. Mm -hmm. In fact, we did, we did not and we tried to kind of trust our cross-validation. Right. Could you maybe uh, speak a bit about cross-validation skills that you picked up over time and any tips for that? Mm, sure. So uh, for this competition, uh, the validation scheme uh, that I personally used was um, a stratified multi-label uh, cross-validation. So mm -hmm. This means that uh, I try to balance uh, faults so that uh, the ratio of the combination of each defects uh, is the uh, same between the train and validation. So mm -hmm. I, in total, I had uh, four uh, faults for this, and uh, Dmitry and uh, Boris had different um, validation scheme, but similar. So okay. when we average our models it's also was working well because they, we have some di diverge of model predictions here mm -hmm. what okay. is what is what is funny when we train it higher res resolution network uh, which it was really heavy and uh, it took maybe almost two days on uh, your trip uh, no on uh, eight v v hundred okay <laughs> So it was like burning a lot of money, uh, <laughs> but we, I, I had really high hopes for this network is since it's uh, claimed to have state of the art uh, performance yep. on the segmentation and it didn't work anywhere close to okay. what we have with the ResNet 34. Got it. it so, <laughs> no, I mean, the, the, this is a Kaggle and- uh, Yep, the, it's Kaggle. <laughs> So it, it's, it still can be the case that I have implementation problem uh, in the in the code, mm -hmm. but um, this is how it, 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 it can be, so. Yeah. Uh, so this has been a great interview. My uh, final question to you would be, what best advice is uh, maybe a single or multiple would you have for someone just started or just getting started on Kaggle or uh, machine learning broadly speaking? Uh, for me, uh, using Kaggle for learning um, is great, a great idea. And uh, I see no reason why you shouldn't do Kaggling to uh, practice your skills. Uh, it allows you to get into community, speak to others, share ideas, uh, get some tips or mentoring, uh, learn from the public kernels. It's uh, great uh, way to go in to get into the uh, machine learning. Mm -hmm. So uh, keep going, um, do competing, do cuggling, or there are plenty of the uh, sources as, uh, um, on the competitive machine learning, competitive platforms, not only Kaggle. So uh, 
I think it's uh, the right place if you have uh, this um, uh, time and graphic cards. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> graphic cards is definitely helpful. No, but I mean, if you love competing. Okay, got it. So um, I can imagine that it's uh, not in everyone's nature to try to push its limits, right? Yeah. So if, if that's something that resonates with your nature, then yeah, go for it. If if not, if you don't like it, or if you don't like to work in the time constrained conditions, uh, it's probably not the best way for you to learn. Mm -hmm. And you have to find your way what works well, work was, work was best for you. But yeah. for me, uh, it's definitely the way how I like to learn. Awesome. Uh, what would be the best best platforms to follow you and follow your work before we end the interview? Uh, okay, so uh, I think you are uh, can reach me on uh, Kaggle forums and uh, also on the Open Data Science uh, Slack. So, okay, and uh, feel free to reach me on my email. You can share it uh, afterwards. Okay, so um, I'm open to any questions and. Uh, you can ask me whatever question you have regarding computer vision or um, machine learning. I'm happy to answer. That's very kind of you. Thank you so much, uh, Eugene, for joining me on the podcast. And thank you so much for all of your open source and Kaggle contributions. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, see you on Kaggle. <laughs> <laughs>